Good morning or good afternoon, AP. This should be our last lecture for Chapter 6, uh, Unit 3. And I'm hoping that this one won't be as long because traditionally I would give a little bit of the class time on this last day of this unit to work on those terms. So hopefully we're going to be done recording a little bit early. So we're going to finish up this unit. Uh, as you know, uh, your terms are due at the start of class on Friday, turned in you know, through the traditional way like you would an essay. Uh, and your test is going to be Monday. All right, so let's jump into it. So the Ohio Valley becomes very, very important. If you can imagine sort of the big picture, and let me see if I can go back to that map that we had of North America here. The English at this point are trying to go definitely trying to go west. They're, they're expanding. And in particular, George Washington's family is trying to get here in this Ohio Valley. The French have a really strong hold in New Orleans at that moment, and really strong in what we now think of as Canada. But they're pretty perilous here. And what they don't want to see happen is for that to get divided. So the French are going to start setting up a series of forts right along many of these rivers right here at this friction point. So at the very place where the American, the uh, English colonists are trying to move west, it's the very point that the French are like, oh my gosh, we can't let this happen here. Or it's going to split up this sort of new empire. So at this moment in history comes George Washington, because he and several other families, all FFVs, have some, as your book calls it, uh, shaky, uh, I'll call it sketchy, legal rights to some 500,000 acres in this area. Uh, and they say shaky because the purchases were, you know, I, I don't think the people that truly own the land were the ones selling it, you know, Native Americans. So at the same time, the French are setting up or attempting to set up these forts in what we would now think of as Pittsburgh along these rivers, three rivers in particular. So in 1754, George Washington, in this general region right here, around what we think of as Pittsburgh, runs into, he has a force of 150 men, and he runs into 33 Frenchmen, detachment of French troops. And his first instinct is to do what George Washington is also often going to do in his youth, and that is shoot. And he orders his men to shoot, and they end up killing the French leader. Now, here's where I think the textbook gets a little confusing, because maybe for the standards of the time, this is true, uh, but for our sensibilities, it's not. The French, quote from the textbook, promptly returned with reinforcements and surrounded Washington in his fort necessity. Okay, so Washington knew they were going to be coming back. Hastily returned. It was two months. It was two months later. Hastily to me would be like, I don't know, the next day. Uh, but this is 1754. Now, I vividly remember learning about fort necessity and then seeing it for the first time and losing my mind in disappointment over what this fort was. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not talking about a fort. We're talking about, that looks like something like we could build like with just a, a couple good days, you know, like kind of like a clubhouse type thing. I mean, this thing is ridiculous. This is sort of the, oh, by the way, there's an early picture of George Washington. How would a 21 year old have command already of 150 men? Well, he's an FFV, but they had this little storehouse in the center uh, with some food, munitions, and water. And then they just had this really, really primitive fort, you know, palisade around it. Uh, this was one of my AP students who happened on her way to college to go by it and said, oh, I've got to see if it's as ridiculous uh, as Penrose said it was. And yes, it is as ridiculous as I said it was. So this is not exactly uh, the largest fort you've ever seen. And that's what he is holding down in. And he is only able to hold this fort for about 10 hours. Now, he negotiates a retreat, and he's even allowed to walk away with his colors and all of his men. He just has to give up the territory. Pretty nice terms, considering he didn't negotiate with the French party he ran into. He immediately shot. And his shots actually are the first recorded shots of the French and Indian War. So very ironically the war that is going to show the tremendous social divisions between the American colonists and the British was started by a, a, a British, well, American colonist, uh, George Washington, who goes on to lead that nation, obviously. So, ladies and gentlemen, this leads to this war. Oh, as a side note about Washington, 
He said about that first day, I heard the bullets whistle, and believe me, there's something charming in the sound. Uh, that man had a hunger for excitement, and I'm not sure if that's, <laughs> that's always a good thing. Okay, so this next war, the French and Indian War, is by far the most important conflict that we've studied. Because all of these other wars essentially started in Europe. This one is going to start here, and it's going to be all about here. Now, Europe is going to become engulfed in this thing altogether. It ends up getting fought in Europe, the West Indies, the Philippines, Africa. It's all over the place. England and Prussia on one side, France, Spain, Austria, and Russia on the other side. It is going to be a true world war, but it, is, it originates in basically the Ohio Valley, ends up being fought on the frontier of the American colonies, and is just just tremendously important for the development of the what would become the United States. Some of the things that led to our development are very negative things. So one of the things that the British noticed immediately is that we ignore them all the time. This seems to be when they realize, oh, they don't care what we say. Uh, we had our little examples of uh, Sophia having a curfew and, you know, all of a sudden I try to enforce it. This is going to be when they realize, oh, they've been coming home at five in the morning. We should start enforcing some of our rules. A specific example. They demanded that all 13 of these colonies, most directly involved in this war at the start, send representatives to Albany, New York. Only seven of the 13 colonies bothered to do exactly what they were ordered to do. The whole purpose of this was to unify them in their defense. And colonies at that moment did not see uh, or have a particular loyalty necessarily to the other colonies. Now, ironically, our angst against the British eventually is what's going to unify us. So that's when Benjamin Franklin puts out this very famous cartoon. I don't happen to have uh, a copy of it here, but they join or die. So this is going to lead the British to sending one of their best generals to defend this key area and to attack these French forts, and that's General Braddock. And so in 1755, with 2,000 men, he's going to attack uh, Fort Duquesne. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's look at some pictures here. This is a really goofy graphic that I did, but Braddock is going to have himself a horrific loss, and the the whole idea here is that Braddock is going to have the superior manpower, 2,000 men. He's going to have the superior firepower, uh, lots of cannon, heavy artillery, well-equipped British soldiers. And yet, when faced against a force that only had 72 French regular troops, only 146 sort of French frontiersmen, we would call them Canadians, and then 637 Native Americans. So we're looking at, you know, less than half of that force with a much less uniform set of guns and no artillery to speak of, Braddock is going to get destroyed. Why? Because Braddock is used to fighting in Europe. And that is something that the Americans, the American colonials are going to notice right away. The British are kind of like, this is how we do things. There's a book on this. There's a page on that. There's a chapter on that. Oh, when you engage the enemy, you do X, Y, and Z. And their little game plan works brilliantly on the open battlefields of Europe. It does not work in the wilderness of the New World. And they are absolutely unwilling to adapt. And when American colonists point out some of these faults, they are poo-pooed by uh, the British as, oh, you just, you cowardly Americans. And so what happens to Braddock is he is moving through the forest. And because he has all this artillery and because he actually has an insane amount of things like tea sets, I mean, just ridiculous supplies, his line stretches out four miles long. Now, when you have a line four miles long, it doesn't matter that you have 2,000 men compared to, say, roughly 900 Native Americans, because what they can do, which, by the way, the British thought was cowardly, is that they can attack in one specific place. They can focus all of their firepower on one specific place, and it is very hard for this thin line to come back and defend. Now, if that thin line of British soldiers do come back to defend, then they simply, I just moved a tree, they just simply disperse again, and then once they try to start moving again, they attack another point in the line. Now, I'm going to read from the American Spirit Reader. I didn't make you guys look at this one. 
This is a great quote, a uh, series of great quotes from somebody you may know who was there, which was Ben Franklin. And so Ben Franklin says, Braddock, I think, was a brave man and might have made a, a figure as a good officer. I'm reading from the American Spirit Reader, if it's not obvious. But he had too much self-confidence, too high of an opinion of himself and his regular troops, and too mean of one of both Americans and Indians. So he's quoting Braddock, and Braddock says, the, oh, my apologies. Franklin says, the only danger I apprehend of obstruction to your march is from ambush of Indians. Such a slender line, four miles long, which your army must make, may expose it to be attacked by surprise on its flanks. Flanks is a fancy word for the ends, uh, sort of your, your weak points. And we'll actually get into that in the next chapter. And Braddock says, quote, these savages may indeed be a formidable enemy to your raw American militia. But upon the king's regular and disciplined troops, sir, it is impossible that they shall make any such impression. Um, in the preceding attack, they lost, let's see, 63 out of 86 officers were killed or wounded. 714 men out of the 1,100 directly under his command, and Braddock himself was killed. With the final words of, who would have thought it? He's absolutely destroyed and devastated. And now, there was no military force for quite some time on the western frontier to defend this. And by the way, one of those men, one of the officers that did survive, was George Washington, who very bravely fought, had two horses shot out from under him and four bullet holes in his coat. So he ends up being put in, quote-unquote, command of a ragtag force of 300 men who are in charge of defending the entire frontier. Uh, I mean... The number of scalpings and attacks on frontier, uh, American colonial frontiersmen, absolutely insane. And the British realize we are in for it here. This is going to be a longer battle than we thought. That's when William Pitt emerges on the scene. Now, William Pitt has the position of what we would think of today as prime minister. So he is a leader that's very important, but he, he never sets foot, uh, to my knowledge, in the New World. He certainly doesn't fire a shot. He is a political leader. And... William Pitt says, okay, we need a whole new strategy. If we try to fight them everywhere, we're going to have problems. We're going to attack them at their heart. And what is the heart of the French Empire? It's Quebec and Montreal. So those are the only real settlements. Everything else is sort of these scattered trading posts. So let's attack them there, and, and you know, the military line is they'll wither on the vine. If you just attack them at the heart, they'll wither on the vine. So protecting the entrance to Quebec and Montreal is Fort Lewisburg, which is the fort that we had, the British had given up in negotiations from the last war because, ah, well, it was just American lives that lost that. They did take that. Then Quebec was attacked next. 32-year-old officer by the name of James Wolfe uh, is a British officer who just makes a name for himself for his bravery. I believe he dies in this attack. Um, but he'd been an officer since age 14. I mean, what are you doing with your life? He was, he's a British officer by age 14. By the way, you can make the same judgment of me. Uh, Montreal Falls in, in 1760. I know we're just flying through this. We don't care as much about the battles as the results. And by 1763, the British have defeated the French. And the Treaty of Paris is signed. There's many Treaty of Parises. And even though the Spanish allied with them, uh, the French just gave up a good chunk of their empire uh, that they realized they couldn't hold any more to the Spanish for sort of dragging them into this. And the French end up giving up virtually everything in their empire, which let's go back to that map we looked at at the beginning. You know, we told you at one point they had a pretty big empire here, really geographically larger than the English colonies. And now they're gone. They are in, I believe, the West Indies, and I think that is it. And so now all of this territory in yellow, that's ours. That's the British holdings. Now, the Spanish actually gain holdings here. They end up gaining all of this territory because, again, the French just said, here, you can have it. We can't seem to hold on to it anyway. And this is what the French are left with. I mean, that is absolutely insane. It just shows a complete devastation. So this should be a good thing for the British and the American colonials because together really we are one entity in theory, we have just crushed the French and just removed them essentially from the New World. And the Spanish were helping the French, so I don't know if we're 
essentially afraid of them either. But there are big consequences of this war. This is the war that shattered the idea that the British could never be defeated. There were a lot of Americans who saw what Braddock did and said, man, I don't, I don't know if these guys are quite as good as they think they are. They're incredible in Europe, but you know, here we might know what we're doing more than they do. It also showed that they had total and utter contempt of us, that they did not view us as British citizens. They viewed us as Americans, as something different. And when we realize that they view us as something different, we start to, to identify as something different. You've got to remember that by 1763, many of the people, many of the quote unquote English citizens who are in the colonies, they've never been to England. It was their grandparents, maybe great grandparents, who brought them here. And so even though they grew up thinking of themselves as British citizens, they'd only known America. I mean, I don't know when your particular family came to this world. And you can have, like a lot of people do, including me, some pride in your, you know, I have pride in my heritage. But I mean, I don't have any loyalty to Ireland. I mean, it's, it's relatives in my past that moved here from there. I mean, I've grown up in America. And it, and again, the further, you know, the more generations that occurs in, the more you start to you know, you understand, oh, they don't feel very British. Add to that to just, again, the insults that we must endure. They mock us all the time. We are viewed as lesser than, and, and listen, culturally, we clearly are. But I mean, the things like sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite, that's like a a thing that British officers would also say to each other as like, oh my gosh, you have to stay in America? Oh, sleep tight. Don't let the bed bugs bite. That place is filthy. Look at something as simple as George Washington, who is a lieutenant colonel in 1754, gets demoted because we can't let any colonial rise above the rank of captain. That, that's insulting. Uh, how about this one? The Yankee Doodle. Um, I'm not going to go through all the lyrics. Uh, very, very few people know all of the lyrics anyway. But when you're a kid, you know, you might sing this kid version. But the first paragraph here is the same in both versions. Yankee Doodle went to town. I, obviously, I won't sing. This is for your benefit. I promise that you're winning by me not singing. But this is a song that the British would sing to make fun of us. Now, eventually, we adopt it because that's a very American thing. We're like, oh, you're going to make fun of us for this? And then we sort of turn it on its head. But Yankee Doodle, that's us. That was sort of a derivative for American colonials. Went to town a riding on a pony. Okay, I'm going to stop right there and just attack that line. At that time, in that era, what do men, what do soldiers ride? A horse, a steed. Y you were judged even more so by the type of horse you rode than you are today, maybe by the kind of car you drive. It was even a bigger deal. And the Americans come riding into town on a pony. Who rides ponies? Little kids ride ponies. We are just getting shot up right here. We are just getting destroyed by the British in the very first line. He stuck a feather in his hat and called it macaroni. Don't believe me, you can Google it, but macaroni at the time was English slang for fashion. So they are saying, we are so uncultured that we'll take some turkey feathers, stick it in our hat and go, look, it's fashion. In the first, is that a stanza? I'm not a music guy. In the very first couple lines, they're basically saying, oh, we're not men, we're children, and we have no fashion sense. We'll just stick a feather in our hat and go, yay, it's fashion. They are destroying us. They look down upon us. And in return, we start to look at them as a bunch of snobs as well, who do you think you are? And it's really gonna get ugly after the war when everything should be best because then Native Americans are gonna realize, oh my gosh, we've lost the ability to pit the English uh, and the French and the Spanish against each other because essentially the English have such dominant control of at least part of North America that their Pontiac, uh, a Native American treat, chief, tries to have another pan-Indian alliance to attack and they are defeated. Now defeated mostly through really germ warfare, blankets with smallpox, et cetera, but defeated. At that point, the British make the decision, okay, 
this has cost us a lot of money. Let's just everybody settle down. Let's everybody, you know, stop going out on the Western frontier. Let's make everything so, you know, we, we don't have any more conflict. Let's regroup. This has been a big, expensive war. Good, we won, but let's regroup and settle in before we start making any more conflicts. Americans, American colonials look at this and go, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Why wouldn't we move west? We've just defeated really the largest Native American threats. We just won the French and Indian War. We have won. Let's enjoy the fruits of that. We're going to go and expand west. And so in 1763, the British just issued the proclamation of 1763, which says, you may not move west. And thousands upon thousands of Americans promptly ignore it and move west. That is going to make the British realize, oh, they don't care what we say. Let's make them care. And so that is going to set the stage for a little conflict in our future, which you may or may not have heard of, called, what was it? Oh, the American Revolution. Ladies and gentlemen, that is everything for this unit, for this chapter. Uh, there will be no uh, recorded lecture on Friday because it's review game day. But because we have a live session, we just get to play that review game live. Uh, so I will post a reminder, but there will be no uh, recorded lecture for Friday. It's review game. And actually, there won't be a recorded lecture for Monday because that's a test day. Uh, but those, uh, those terms are due by the start of class Friday. We will play the review game Friday. And your test will, remember, appear in your feed at whatever the start of your class is, 115, I think, uh, on Monday. Okay? Everybody have a great day.